morning again, everybody. If, if you would, I'm going to have you turn in your Bibles to Revelation chapter 11. <clears throat> and it's been a little bit, but you may recall, very, may recall if you think back just a little bit, um, in the last message, uh, we covered chapter 10 in its entirety. <clears throat> and we talked about the fact that chapter 10 was like a little bit of an interlude uh, or an intermission between the 6th and the 7th trumpets. And we're kind of still in that section here as we find ourselves in, in chapter 11. In chapter 10, uh, the Apostle John was told to take a scroll and then eat it. And in that, as we talked about, we saw John being commissioned as a prophet. And so he is to bring forth and foretell what is going to occur in the future by God. And he was called very much in the same way that we saw the prophet Ezekiel was called in that he was told to eat the little scroll. And the scroll was sweet to his taste, but it made his stomach bitter. And we talked about the fact that sometimes when it comes to the word of God, that's the way things are. Uh, it's sweet to our taste, but it also... Uh, at times has kind of a bitter aspect that comes along with it. And we are going to continue to see that theme as well as we continue uh, through uh, the book of Revelation here. So with that, uh, let us resume in chapter 11 here. And I'm going to read through uh, from the beginning of the chapter through verse 13. Looking at Revelation 11, the word of God says, There was given me a measuring rod like a staff, and someone said, Get up and measure the temple of God and the altar and those who worship in it. Leave out the court which is outside the temple and do not measure it, for it has been given to the nations, and they will tread underfoot the holy city for 42 months. And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. These are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies, so that if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. They have the power to shut up the sky, so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood, and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them, and overcome them and kill them. And their bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate. And they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them and they stood on their feet and great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up to heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. And let's stop right there and pray. Heavenly Father, we ask you in your grace as we look into your word this day that you would grant to us your Holy Spirit, that your Holy Spirit would help us to understand these words, help us to understand the truth of these words and to, them, to then apply them. 
and Father, I do uh, ask that in a special way this day is uh, we know that this is a very difficult passage that we have in front of us. Uh, and we approach this passage with, with humility as we know how many godly brothers and sisters have so many different views of this passage. But uh, we ask you to uh, make the truth plain to us uh, that we can apply it to ourselves and uh, bring it into our hearts. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> so it has been said by many commentators that this is probably the most difficult chapter in all of Revelation to interpret. Uh, I kind of feel sometimes like a broken record getting up here and talking about uh, how difficult it can be to preach some of these passages because there are so many different opinions and views about what we have before us. But uh, the silver lining is, is I find it and I constantly marvel at this as I've uh, studied this intently with the intent to bring it before all of you at how no matter which way we cut or slice these passages there always seems to be a plain simple truth that stands out in them uh, if we can overlook the little details. Uh, it's plenty easy to focus on the details and get lost in them to the point that uh, we focus on these different interpretations and then we lose the plain truth that's right in front of us. Um, so I've been very encouraged on, on our journey through this book because I find the same thing here. And it's, it's not a cop-out to uh, prevent trying to study it or approach this passage prayerfully, uh, but rather it's just, uh, I think, uh, being humble and being realistic about how much we can actually uh, put our foot down on uh, in passages such as this. So uh, for that reason, because there are so many different views, um, I think this is going to be one of those messages where things might seem a little bit disjointed uh, because I'm going to try to give you some of the different interpretations that are, are out there. Uh, but at the same time, I want to be able to bring it before you uh, so that you can kind of bask in uh, the plain truth that we find here in this section. Uh, so I know I say stuff like that an awful lot, but uh, honestly, I think that's the only responsible way that I can teach this book. Uh, is be honest about what we can know and then uh, just be humble uh, and, and try to make the main things the plain things, if you will otherwise. <clears throat> so this section of chapter 11 forms kind of a summary, if you will, of all the things that are to follow in the remainder of the book of Revelation. So part of this intermission here is this is going to function as kind of an outline. And in this section, John is giving us some truth of how things are going to kind of cycle through towards the end. And uh, as I said last week, major spoiler alert, as we continue through chapter 11 here, it tells us how everything is going to end. Because all the kingdoms of the world are going to become the kingdom of our God and his Christ, the way things rightfully are supposed to be. Uh, so I always try to keep that in mind, uh, not only as I approach the book of Revelation, but as I approach life in general. Um, the good news is that the end has been declared from the beginning and all those who are in Christ are going to have victory in Christ uh, because Jesus wins in the end. <clears throat> so as we said previously in the end of the last chapter, we saw John called and commissioned as a prophet and in a way very, very similar to the way that Ezekiel was called. And the other thing that's interesting about this chapter is we immediately find John asked to perform certain actions that are also very, very close to the actions that were carried out by the prophet uh, Ezekiel. Uh, and in that, John is told to measure the temple. Uh, in the opening verse, John is given a rod. And literally in the text, it is a reed. Um, there were these reeds that would grow and they were incredibly long and straight uh, and also lightweight. So they naturally made very, very nice and handy measuring devices. 
and typically what they would do is they would cut these off at a length of six cubits and so a cubit was traditionally the length of the tip of the finger to the elbow was considered to be a cubit and it was about 18 inches so if they made six, uh, six cubits then one of these rods would be approximately nine feet long and of course it's not a perfect measurement because everybody's arm is a little bit of a different length uh, but they were typically about nine feet long and then so this rod could be used uh, for measurements uh, you can kind of think of it as like an ancient yardstick I know when I was a kid it seemed like I, I used to notice that just about every household had a yardstick uh, it's not so common nowadays I think most of that is due to uh, Stanley uh, their 25 foot tape has pretty much replaced the yardstick I think um, and so now everybody has you know a tape measure or three uh, but back in the day we used to use yardsticks so we can think of this as kind of the ancient world's yardstick and so he is told to take this rod and to measure uh, the temple but not just the temple and I think this is uh, important in how we interpret this text he is told not just to measure the temple but also the altar and the people that worship there so I think this is important for our interpretation of the text. Furthermore, we're not given any actual measurements. So he's told to do this, and to me it kind of screams to us that this is a symbolic action. Uh, he doesn't come back and report back, okay, you know, the temple's uh, so many rods long, or so on and so forth. So clearly this is not a set of building instructions that he's given us here about how we're supposed to, you know, construct something. And he doesn't really give us any details about the measurement. Um, but like I said, he's also told to measure the altar and he's told to measure the people. Uh, so I don't think he's measuring their height or anything like that. So clearly, I think we are supposed to interpret this as a symbolic action in his measuring. And given the context of the passage here, I think the best way to understand this is often in the Old Testament when people were told to measure things, uh, it was in the sense that it was demonstrating God's ownership and his protection being placed upon them. And I think that's the way that we're supposed to understand here in the text. That this temple and the people in it are being measured. The protection of God is being placed on them. They are being marked by God very, very similar to the way that we saw the 144,000 being marked out uh, and being protected by God back in chapter 7. Uh, and again, I think that just comes from clues uh, located in the text here. <clears throat> uh, some people uh, interpret this temple, the temple itself, as being the heavenly temple. Uh, other people see it as being a representation of the church. Uh, that this is, uh, in general, believers in God that are being measured out and protected by God. Um, I have a little bit of a problem with both of those interpretations, uh, mostly as far as the heavenly temple goes, because the outer court is said to be left out. Um, so if we think about the way that the temple used to be constructed, there was an outer court known as the court of the Gentiles. And because the Gentiles were considered to be unclean, the Gentiles were only allowed to come as far as that outer court. They were not allowed to come further into the temple complex because being unclean, uh, they would have defiled the temple area. Okay? And then further in, they had the, temp the court of women. So then Jewish ladies were allowed to come in that far. Then there was a court further in where uh, Jewish men were allowed to come in. And then it was further sectioned off where only the priesthood was allowed to go. And then, of course, in the very center of the temple was the Holy of Holies, the place where only the high priest was allowed to go, and him only once a year so that he could make atonement for the people. So, clearly, if this was a heavenly temple, I don't really see how the outer court would come into play here, because we're told in the text that it was given to the nations to be trampled upon, okay? So I think that we're supposed to view here some form of an earthly temple uh, and 
this has not always been a popular interpretation, uh, probably predominantly because there hasn't been a temple in existence for almost 2,000 years. Uh, but the way I personally read the text, um, when we get further on through Revelation, I think a temple becomes necessary when we look at the actions of the Antichrist that are to come later on in world history. So I personally believe that there will be a temple that will be reconstructed uh, at some point uh, before the Antichrist comes to power and is revealed to the world. Um, that's my personal interpretation. Uh, again, the other interpretations, I can't say that those are wrong. Um, I certainly wouldn't be bold enough to say that. Uh, but this is, to me, the, the natural way uh, to understand the text. Uh, furthermore, it also becomes very interesting to me that if we take into account that the outer court was to be left out, um, on the Temple Mount, where as it sits right now, uh, the dimensions of the temple would be somewhat altered because there's actually an Islamic mosque on the Temple Mount right now known as the Dome of the Rock. And so if there was a temple that would be built there in the future, that would kind of change things up a little bit about how things are constructed. So just some things to keep in mind. Um, but it is interesting to me that there are people who are uh, planning as we speak to rebuild the Jewish temple at some point. Uh, and I'm one of these people, I kind of keep an ear out and I kind of pay attention to those sort of things. Um, because when private, as far as it comes with prophecy, I think uh, in many aspects it does um, suit us to have a Bible in one hand and kind of pay attention to what's going on with the other. Uh, because um, I believe that all these things are going to become clearer and clearer as, as time goes on uh, for the people that are living uh, in the times when these things come to fruition. One of the things as of late that I find interesting is there was actually five red heifers that were sent from Texas to Jerusalem. Uh, and the reason for that is if we go back to Numbers chapter 19, uh, they would actually need the ashes of a red heifer to purify all the things that would be needed to reconstruct the temple. Um, there have only been a couple of red heifers throughout the entire history of Israel because a red heifer literally has to be a red heifer. And even so much as one hair that's out of the color spectrum is enough to disqualify that heifer from being used. Um, but certainly we have more prospects right now than we've seemingly had at any other time. So. In my opinion, it bears watching. Uh, let me also state that we don't watch this from the aspect that we're necessarily excited to see a temple constructed. Uh, I think our time in the book of Hebrews should have made it very, very plain that in God's eyes, the time for temple worship has passed because all those things were simply pointing forward to the Lord Jesus Christ. And... So therefore, it's not that we're celebrating the, the building of the temple, but simply interested in it uh, as far as world history goes and God's plan uh, for the end times goes. So I just wanted to kind of uh, put that out there. <clears throat> uh, I think either in any which way we understand the temple in this passage, uh, we have God measuring and, as I said, marking a group out uh, for protection and I cannot read this section honestly uh, when we see the uh, continued reference back to the three and a half year period the time times and half a times we have here 42 months and we have 1260 days which is Jewish reckoning for a period of three and a half years um, we talked earlier about Daniel's prophecy of the 70 weeks and we're constantly uh, reminded in that section uh, about the fact that there is a 70th week. Uh, the first 69 weeks came to pass in the prophecy about the coming of Jesus and the fact that at the end he would be cut off, but not for himself. And so we had a very clear biblical timeline given in Daniel for the coming of the Lord Jesus and his crucifixion, but there's one 
week left in that prophetic calendar that is yet to be fulfilled. And that coincides, in my reading, uh, very, very well with what is stated about the Antichrist. And we're going to talk, uh, Lord willing, more about the Antichrist as we come into other sections about him. As we continue through this section, I want to uh, focus on the two witnesses. But as we go forward, um, we'll talk in more detail about the events surrounding the Antichrist. And uh, if you're confused on that, um, you have my, my utmost sympathy. I totally understand. There's so much material that comes into play here, but hopefully we'll, we'll go through and shed some light on that uh, as we go through. But in that prophecy to Daniel from, from Daniel chapter 9, um, he was told explicitly that that prophecy was going to concern his people and his holy city. Okay, so that's the Jews and Jerusalem. So therefore, I cannot read any of these sections about the end times without having the Jewish people in the back of my mind. And so I, the way I read it here, perhaps this is a reference to God marking out those Jews who will finally come to faith in Christ, come to repentance, and recognize Jesus as being their Messiah, and come to faith. Because when I read these sections uh, about the end times here, I'm constantly thinking about Daniel's prophecies and also Romans chapter 11, 25, and 27, which I think very clearly states that uh, perhaps not every individual Jew, but the Jewish people as a nation will eventually come to faith and be saved. And so uh, that may be what is referenced here by God measuring out uh, the temple itself. <clears throat> uh, again, John is told to leave out the outer court as that it, what is outside has been given to the nations and they will trample the holy city for 42 months. So as I've already alluded to, 42 months would be equal to uh, three and a half years. Daniel was told that there would be a time of the greatest persecution of his people, uh, a time that is elsewhere known as the time of Jacob's trouble, and it would be three and a half years long. And so we have here a time frame that corresponds exactly to that or half of that last 70th week, okay? And we'll talk about more about that as we go along as well, but I at least wanted uh, to touch on it. <clears throat> uh, in verse 3, it is said that God will grant authority to his two witnesses and they will prophesy for 1260 days. Again, by Jewish reckoning, this would be a period of three and a half years. So we keep seeing that time period uh, showing up again and again. Uh, as far as these two witnesses, it says that they will be clothed in sackcloth. And whether this is understood literally or figuratively, sackcloth was associated with mourning and repentance. And sackcloth was a very, very rough material. And in the Old Testament, very frequently when people uh, wanted to humble themselves and they were feeling repentant, then they would dress themselves in this rough sackcloth and they would even pour ashes on their head. And they were said to be repenting in sackcloth and ashes. And so that's what's being communicated to us here through this uh, wearing of sackcloth is we see that these two witnesses are uh, demonstrating humility and they are preaching to the people, trying to get them to repent. Uh, undoubtedly bringing with them a message of judgment if they fail to turn back to God and repent and place their trust in Christ. And so this is the picture that is being painted here. So why are there two witnesses? Well, I think the answer to this question is because in the Old Testament, under the law, every matter was to be confirmed by at least two or more witnesses. And so here we have two witnesses uh, that are prophesying uh, and being specially empowered by God here for that purpose. So when we get down to identities, who are these two witnesses and how are we to understand them? Well, this is a matter of no small debate. Uh, there are many, many different interpretations on this as well. Um, 
Probably classically, I would say the most common interpretation here was that these two witnesses represent uh, uh, Elijah and Enoch. And the reason that's typically given for that is because these are both individuals who were taken to heaven directly and never died um, while they were on earth. And so a lot of people argue, well, uh, they've never died before, so God is going to bring them back. And because Hebrews uh, 9.27 says that it's appointed for everyone to die once, and then after that, the judgment, then these two must be coming back, and then they'll finally be killed, and they will die on earth like everybody else um, during their ministry. Uh, and quite frankly, that I'm aware of, that's pretty much the crux of how that um, viewpoint goes. Um, and that could be 100% uh, correct. Uh, I, however, tend to favor the view um, that the two witnesses are actually uh, Elijah and Moses. Uh, and the reasons for that uh, come down to uh, mostly the miracles that we see them performing during their ministry. And I'll touch on that as, as we get to it. Uh, but we are told that these are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. Uh, this is a reference to Zechariah chapter 4, which helps us to understand the main point here. Um, and as I said, I will get back to the identities of Moses, Moses and Elijah as we go on. Um, but they, we are expressly told here that they are the two olive trees and the two lampstands that stand before the Lord of the earth. So if you would, I want you to turn to Zechariah chapter 4. We'll do a little bit of jumping around here this, this morning. So in Zechariah chapter 4, <clears throat> verse 2, he said to me, what do you see? And I said, I see and behold the lampstand all of gold with its bowl on the top of it, and its seven lamps on it with seven spouts belonging to each of the lamps which are on top of it. And also two olive trees by it, one on the right side of the bowl and the other on its left side. Then I said to the angel who was speaking with me, saying, What are these, my Lord? So the angel who was speaking with me answered and said to me, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, saying, Not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. What are you, O great mountain? Before Zerubbabel you will become a plain, and he will bring forth the top stone with shouts of grace, grace to it. And the word of the Lord came to me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house, and his hands will finish it. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me to you. For who has despised the day of small things? But these seven will be glad when they see the plumb line in the hand of Zerubbabel. <clears throat> these are the eyes of the Lord which range to and fro throughout the earth. Then I said to him, What are these two olive trees on the right of the lampstand and on its left? And I answered the second time and said to him, What are the two olive branches which are beside the two golden pipes, which empty the golden oil from themselves? So he answered me, saying, Do you not know what these are? And I said, No, my Lord. Then he said, These are the two anointed ones who are standing by the Lord of the whole earth. And so we are pretty clearly directed right back here to this passage. And what I read to you here is quite a bit. But what I think we find here is John repurposing this passage to speak of the future. And it's very, very common for us to find in Scripture 
both a near and a far fulfillment. And so originally, uh, at the time that this text from Zechariah was given, it referred to Joshua the high priest and Zerubbabel and things that took place in their time. And John is reinterpreting this and stating that this will also apply to a time in the future when he is hereby applying it to these two witnesses. But the secret, I believe, that we're supposed to take away from this passage as we look at, back at Revelation 11 is not by might nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Because if anything ultimately is going to take place and anything is going to move, it is going to be through the spirit of the power of God. And we are going to see that demonstrated powerfully uh, by these two witnesses uh, who God uh, has decided to send forth at some point in the future. Now, whether or not these are literally going to be uh, Elijah and Moses coming back, uh, I wouldn't dare say. But I think if we look at other examples in the Bible, they will probably be two individuals who will operate uh, in, in like power of Moses and Elijah through the Spirit of God. Uh, in fact, Jesus himself said uh, when asked that Elijah, in a sense, had already come in the person of uh, John the Baptist because John the ba Baptist came in the spirit of Elijah to make straight the ways of the Lord before Jesus himself arrived on the scene for his earthly ministry but the Jewish people uh, widely held that Elijah would return before the time of the end before the day of the Lord and this seems to be at least a partial fulfillment of that uh, so let's look further into the text and see why um, I believe that these are the two uh, people that are associated here with these two witnesses. <clears throat> Looking at verses uh, 5 and 6, I've got to make my way back here. And if anyone wants to harm them, fire flows out of their mouth and devours their enemies, so that if anyone wants to harm them, he must be killed in this way. These have the power to shut up the sky so that rain will not fall during the days of their prophecy, and they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every plague as often as they desire. So when it comes to calling down fire, uh, that is one thing that Elijah was certainly known for. In fact, uh, one of the kings kept, kept sending men to Elijah. They kept trying to bring him back. And they kept sending soldiers in lots of 50. And Elijah would simply call down fire and they'd all be incinerated. Um, and I don't know about you, but that's a bad day at work. Uh, when your boss tells you, hey, uh, we need you to go bring Elijah in, and you're thinking... He just incinerated the last 50 guys that you sent to go after him. Now I'm all set. Um, but this is one thing that we see again and again in the ministry of Elijah is him calling down fire. Uh, also, uh, it was Elijah who prayed, who prevented it from raining for a period of, you guessed it, three and a half years. Um, and so these are things very closely associated with the ministry of Elijah while he was on earth. And so I think this is a, a big argument um, for one of these witnesses at least operating uh, in the power of Elijah through the Holy Spirit. Uh, also, as we read in verse 6 here, uh, one of these witnesses or these witnesses will also have the power to turn water into blood and to bring plagues upon the earth uh, at their will. And so again, um, we've seen a theme as we've moved through here of some close associations with the book of Exodus. And I think here we have another one uh, because of course it was Moses that God used to bring all these plagues, including turning the water into blood uh, against Pharaoh and the people of Egypt. Um, another argument that I think probably comes into play here is when Jesus is transfigured on the Mount of Transfiguration, who appears by his side? None other than Elijah and Moses. And we are told here that these are the, the two anointed ones that stand before the Lord of the whole earth. And uh, 
I find that to be too much of a coincidence uh, for my liking. And so I think that's another reference to these two individuals. Um, can't be dogmatic about it, but um, you know that's that's the way I interpret these um, these two individuals. But the important thing, ultimately, is not their identity. Uh, it's what we see them doing here, and this is the clear take home that we can take home from these uh, two witnesses. <clears throat> I want to read, uh, just to bring it to our mind again here, verses 7 through 10. When they have finished their testimony, the beast that comes up out of the abyss will make war with them and overcome them and kill them. And their dead bodies will lie in the street of the great city, which mystically is called Sodom and Egypt, where also their Lord was crucified. Those from the peoples and tribes and tongues and nations will look at their dead bodies for three and a half days and will not permit their dead bodies to be laid in a tomb. And those who dwell on the earth will rejoice over them and celebrate, and they will send gifts to one another because these two prophets tormented those who dwell on the earth. So one of the things that I want us to very, very clearly see here that we've mentioned time and time again as we've moved through this book is I want to, you to see the sovereign hand of God in this passage. Because we are told that when their testimony was finished was when they were overcome by the beast. Uh, and not a moment sooner. Because God had a purpose for these two individuals and that purpose was realized. So that's the first thing that I want us to see here is the sovereignty of God uh, in this passage. <clears throat> um, in reference to the beast here, this is a clear reference again to the Antichrist. And as I said before, we're going to talk about the Antichrist in later passages as we come to him. Um, but this is a uh, basically a figure who will be the embodiment of all things that oppose God, powered through uh, Satan himself. Okay, And we'll talk about that, uh, as I said, as we go. And so... Uh, he is going to come into play in opposing the, these witnesses to God and ultimately will be successful uh, in killing them. <clears throat> so all the people of the earth will look at them. And as we've talked about, as is referenced in this passage, when we read the term, those who dwell on the earth, that's like a technical term in the book of Revelation, speaking about unbelievers. Okay, So that's a, a, a term that is used here to speak uh, is explicitly to those uh, who don't follow God and don't believe. There will be such joy and celebration because these witnesses have been killed. Uh, it will be like an international holiday to the point we see the exchange of <coughs> gifts here over it. Um, because quite frankly, people don't always want to hear the truth. Um, Scripture makes it very, very plain that the natural man cannot understand the things of God and they are foolishness to him. And if you go God's way and you speak the truth of his word and you condemn things that society doesn't want to hear condemned, uh, you will very quickly find yourself to be an unpopular person. And, uh, you know, we can avoid that for a while by staying quiet. Um, but if you find yourself standing up for, the, for God and for the things of God and speaking the gospel, um, you're going to ruffle people's feathers. And these two witnesses did it uh, in spades, it seems, because they had people so outraged by their testimony and by their preaching uh, that people just couldn't wait to get rid of them. And when they did finally manage to do that, uh, it was time for a celebration. But the celebration was very, very short-lived uh, as far as those who oppose God are concerned. Looking at verse 11, But after the three and a half days, the breath of life from God came into them, and they stood on their feet. And great fear fell upon those who were watching them. And they heard a loud voice from heaven saying to them, Come up here. Then they went up into heaven in the cloud, and their enemies watched them. And in that hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people 
were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. <clears throat> so, some very important developments here. It's one thing when people become a nuisance and they speak a prophetic word and they die. It's totally another thing when after three and a half days they come back to life. And I think very clearly here we are to see the resurrection of the Lord Jesus here. Uh, scripture makes it plain that the ultimate validation of the message that Jesus taught was in his resurrection. Because Jesus made some incredible claims about himself. He claimed to be the Son of God. He claimed to be the Savior of the world. And then he took scripture after scripture after scripture and applied it to himself. But after he died, he didn't stay dead. He came back to life. And that is powerful, powerful testimony to the truth of the words that he spoke. And so it is also with these two witnesses. Uh, after the three and a half days, they are brought back to life. And then, as you can imagine, great fear fell upon all those who witnessed it. Now, when I read this passage, I don't know about you, but it makes me wonder, like this was written in ancient times, and it makes one wonder, how did everybody know about these happenings, and how were people so aware of the death of these witnesses? Because we are told that it's the people from every uh, nation, tribe, tongue. You know, this seems to be a worldwide event. And it makes me wonder if it doesn't speak to a time in the future where now we have things like satellite television and things of that nature where things like this could potentially be broadcast all over the world. But we're told that those who were aware of it, great fear uh, fell upon them because when people come back to life, people start to pay attention. And, uh, you know, it's one thing to make claims, it's another thing to make claims and then rise from the dead after three days. And just as with Jesus' resurrection, there is an important detail in the three days. Uh, it was widely held among the Jews that after you died, the soul stayed around the bottle, body for three days. So it was kind of like in Jewish reckoning, after three days when the spirit left the vicinity of the body, you were dead, dead. Um, and I can tell you this, I have been involved in a number of resuscitations over the years, but they involved minutes that a, that a person had died, not days. Uh, and so when you see somebody that's been dead for three days to the point that they've started to decay, and then they get up uh, and start walking around again, um, that's powerful testimony uh, to their truth claims. <clears throat> And this is the message here, that when we are marked out for God's service, when we are under the protection of God, there's nothing that can happen to us outside of God's control. Uh, it has been said that a man is immortal until God is finished with him. And I think this is an illustration of that. These uh, two individuals, these witnesses, will witness until the appointed time when they will finally be won over by the beast, but not a moment before that. And ultimately, they are under God's spiritual protection. Scripture does not promise us physical protection. Uh, it never does. Uh, being a Christian, biblically, is risky business. And it is going to involve suffering. It is going to involve humility. Uh, it is going to involve difficulty and being uncomfortable. And that's part of the promise. Um, but it was also the, that way for Jesus. Uh, the New Testament makes it plain that suffering and humility comes before glory. And that's the way it was for our Lord. And I don't think that we should expect any different. <clears throat> Philippians 2.5 and following says this to us. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Being found in appearance as a man, 
he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. For this reason also God highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name which is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee will bow, of those who are in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and that every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Furthermore, uh, Scripture tells us that Jesus despised the shame and he went to the cross and he endured what he had to endure looking forward to the joy that lay before him because he knew that the work that he was given to do would result in the salvation of so many. And so we need to have the same mind in ourselves. We need to prepare ourselves to be ready to suffer for the name of Christ. And I have to tell you this. It is mind-blowing to me how quickly I see the climate in our culture changing. Uh, I think like that period we went through with COVID, I think was some kind of a great accelerator of this. But I can tell you, I see it right here locally, an attempt to villainize Christians who stand for the truth and who oppose uh, the wind just blowing any which way it wants as far as culture is concerned. And I tell you, it's not that far-fetched in our day and time to see people uh, celebrating the downfall of Christians or celebrating the defeat of Christians in some way, shape, or form because they are, quite frankly, sick and tired of who we represent. Uh, because we are associated with the Lord Jesus Christ and he himself told us, you will be hated because of me. And if we stand for Christ, uh, the world is going to hate us. And as I said, I see the climate here very, very rapidly changing. Uh, but we have to have this mind of Christ in us as well. And again, it's not going to be through our own power, but by His Spirit. It is only through His Spirit that we can be made bold enough uh, to do what needs to be done. And... Uh, that to me is the great take home from this section here. Uh, not by power or by might, but by my spirit, says the Lord. Um, but hard times are coming. Um, uh, to take another term from Daniel, the writing is on the wall, so to speak. And uh, hard times are coming. We need to be fortified. Uh, we need to be read up on the word. And we need to be committed to stand for Christ no matter what it may cost us uh, because it may come at the cost of ridicule it may come at the cost of ruined reputation it may uh, come at the cost of our very lives and we have to have our deals our heels dug in and be ready for those times uh, so with that let's close in a word of prayer uh, father I can't stop thinking this morning about uh, this feeling of joy that I have in the Lord Jesus Christ. Um, that I know that the battle in your eyes is already over, it's already been won. Uh, the Lord Jesus Christ is going to be victorious. Um, and I know what we have here in the remainder of Revelation as we work through this book basically is going to be about a tale of two cities, uh, the original tale of two cities. And we need to ask ourselves, which city are we going to reside in? Are we going to reside in the city of Babylon or the new Jerusalem, the city of God's people? And uh, it will be costly, Father, we know from your word. Uh, the whole New Testament is full with the idea that it will be costly to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. And Lord, we just ask you in your spirit, through the power of your Holy Spirit, to make us bold for Christ to not be afraid to go share the gospel with those who so desperately need to hear it, no matter what that cost might be. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And I hope you all have a very blessed Sunday.